the tile I drew has a one on it and I'm using that to indicate whether something is easy, medium, or hard. So I've got these tiles that have a one, a two, or a three on them. Not really going with anything deadly right now. We'll save that more for boss type battles. So right now this is going to be considered an easy encounter. And what we do is our characters are first level and we're looking at a, a point system here. So 25 points per party member. We've got five. So that's going to give us a budget of about 125 points to spend on this wolf encounter. Uh, in the monster manual, a wolf is valued at 50 points. And you'll see that in the monster manual. So we could look at uh, having two wolves there. That wouldn't take us over budget. Uh, that would total 100 points. But you have to keep in mind that there may be a modifier if you have more than one creature. So when we look at this here, if there's two monsters, you take their point value and multiply it by this number. So 50, uh, that's going to bring those up to 75 apiece, which will make them 150 points for the two wolves. So how is that going to work? Well, that's actually reading this text here is going to be closer towards an easier encounter so even though it's slightly over budget it's not enough to boost it up to a medium level encounter so uh, two wolves should be fine so like i said if the points were going to take us up into the medium range we'd have to remove one so we're keeping this as an easy encounter so two wolves are appearing in response to the alarm so you can see that information, I think, around page 82 in the Dungeon Master's Guide about putting your encounters together and what kind is an appropriate level of challenge for the level of characters you have. So we're going to bring these two wolves running in uh, here from this direction. So now we're going to start our combat encounter, and it's time to determine initiative. The basic rules would have us uh, roll d20 for each character, add their initiative number, which is here, and uh, determine the order. And then if we rolled for the wolves, we'd roll once for them, uh, for both of them, and, and the characters will roll individually. So why don't we go ahead and do that? We're going to roll for initiative. I just saw an optional rule in the Dungeon Master's Guide that I may want to make use of here, at least for this first encounter. Instead of rolling for all the characters that they said that can slow down the game, uh, what you can do is just basically take 10, add their initiative number, and put them in order. If uh, the players are determining a tie, they can choose which character they want to go first, and if it's the DM has a tie between its monsters, it can choose which monster goes first. So if we do that, we're going to have the rogue and the human uh, folk hero go first. We're going to have the wizard is going to be in the middle. And we're going to have our noble and soldier going uh, towards uh, or last. So where do the wolves fall in? The wolves have an initiative of plus two. That's going to be more like our wizard. So. I think what we'll do here is just do a die roll between the wizard and the uh, wolves and see which one's going to go first. We'll take these two 20-sided dice. The red one will be for the wolves. And uh, the wizard comes out on top. So rogue, fighter, wizard, then the wolves, and then the rest of the party. All right, so our halfling rogue gets to make a decision here. Uh, and our human fighter gets to make a decision here which goes first. He's got his sword out. So probably what he's going to do is try to stop these wolves from approaching uh, to the more squishy party members. So he's going to run up here. Uh, each space is five feet. He can move 30. So that's about six squares. So we're going to move him up right in the face of this wolf and then uh, using his great sword he's going to make an attack 
Well, here's our information on the wolf. It's right out of the monster manual for 5th edition. The armor class we're going to need to attack is 13. And each wolf will use the average hit point uh, level here of 11. So an armor class of 13. I'm not really taking into account any specific penalties regarding light or anything like that. We could certainly do that to add to the atmosphere, make it more difficult, put in a little bit of resource management with torches and that kind of thing. But we're just going to keep it simple right now. Uh, no advantage, disadvantage, or penalty or anything like that. We're just going for a straight attack, plus four on the die roll. And we got a 10 total. So that's going to be a miss. So our fighter misses. Our rogue then is up next. Our rogue has a short bow and the short sword. Let's see, sneak attack. How does sneak attack work in this edition? When you hit a creature with a dexterity based attack, such as a short sword, which is kind of a finesse weapon, or a short bow, uh, you can, and you have advantage, you can deal an extra d6. You don't need advantage if another enemy target, uh, or enemy of the target, is within five feet and isn't incapacitated. So if we could target as I'm reading that, if we could target this wolf who's already engaged with our friend the fighter, we could attempt a, a sneak attack shot with the short bow. So as uh, kind of, I guess, staying where he is and kind of leaning around the corner here, he's going to pull out his bow and attempt a ranged shot with the short bow, plus five to the attack and we rolled a one and I don't think that uh, this is limited per day or anything when you roll a natural one so our lucky rogue gets to try again and a 13 is much better a 13 is gonna hit on its own so now we can do the damage which is a 1d6 plus 3, but we've got this sneak attack adding another d6, so 2d6 plus 3. So we'll grab a couple of six siders here and determine just how badly that wolf was hit. A 6 and a 3, adding another 3, so that's a total of 12 damage. And uh, I believe that's 12 damage. Yes, it is. That, my friends, is enough to kill this wolf in one shot. So a shot uh, right to a vulnerable part on the wolf, let's say right in the neck or maybe through the side into the heart, uh, kills the wolf instantly. So this wolf is out of action. Now we're up to the wizard. And the wizard has a direct line of sight here on this wolf. Let's see what the wizard's going to do been reading some about the spell casting in this edition and uh, I believe that we don't have to use a spell slot to fire off a cantrip and we can use these at will and one of those we might want to make use of is called a ray of frost let's look that up in the little basic rule book I have the ray of frost has a range of 60 feet 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, definitely within range. Uh, this is takes an action. Uh, we fire a beam of blue-white light, and we make a ranged spell attack. And I saw on here that the, um, the wizard's spell casting ability like that is going to be plus 5. So plus 5 to the roll to see if we can hit... Uh, an armor class of 13. 14 on the roll, that's definitely good enough. So it is an effective hit. What does the Ray of Frost do? The Ray of Frost will do 1d8 in cold damage and reduce the speed of the target by 10 until the start of your next turn. Now if we had cast and used a spell slot, I think we could bump up the damage here. Uh, no? Maybe I'm wrong about that. 
well, more about spell casting as we go along and as I learn a little bit more about this edition. But right now we're sure that it's a 1d8, so let's do that. We got a nice five, so five damage to the wolf, and the wolf is slow. So got five damage on that wolf, and we'll put this blue marker here to indicate that that wolf is now slowed. That's going to reduce the wolf's speed from 40 to 30. So I still think uh, we're talking about six spaces here that it can move and still make an attack. And it is the wolf's turn now. <sighs> Probably. The wolf would go towards its nearest uh, foe, and that would be our folk hero fighter. So he's going to move right up here adjacent and uh, make an attack against the fighter. It's going to be a bite attack, and plus four to the attack roll. What do we need to hit for the fighter? What's our fighter's armor class? Our fighter is wearing, oddly enough, he's wearing um, leather armor. Interesting. Uh, armor class is 14, so he's basically going to need to roll a 10 or higher. Got our attack die, and we've rolled a 2, so the wolf misses on its attack. So now we can continue on, and we're going to let the noble go next. Uh, the noble was armed with a javelin, as well as a sword. And that javelin, what's the range on that? 30 feet? Um, if he took a move action, got really good line of sight here. Uh, 5, 10, 15. Yeah, he's definitely within range. So we're going to put him right there clear shot at the wolf. He's going to throw his javelin. His javelin is plus five to the attack. Let's roll the uh, hero white die. A 20. Well, the rules say that when you roll a 20, it's a critical hit. There's no need to confirm it like you used to do in uh, third edition. So it just is supposed to do two times uh, two rolls of the damage dice, but I was watching a, a play, uh, a live D&D game, um, a celebrity game basically, and Chris Perkins, the Dungeon Master, was allowing them to take max damage on the first die roll and then roll a second one and add whatever that was to it. I thought that was really neat because if it's a crit, and let's say I'm rolling these... Uh, these two six sliders and I get a one and a one that would really stink for a critical hit so I kinda like what I think is his house rule so we're just going to assume that that first damage roll is a six that's the critical damage and now we're just gonna roll and see how much we add to that which is a one so a seven and we add three more points to it so seven eight nine ten well that's enough to kill the wolf. It already had five damage on it. So the javelin flies through the air, uh, skewering the wolf, number two, killing it. So that wolf is gone. Our heroes have survived. Nobody took any damage. And we can continue exploring Castle Ravenloft.